Good afternoon, everyone. Alan Davies was appointed Chief Executive Diamond and Minerals for Rio Tinto in August 2012 with accountability for Richard Bay's Minerals, Rio Tinto Ferre Titane, QIT Madagascar Minerals, Rio Tinto Minerals, Rio Tinto Diamonds, Dampier Salt, and the Simindu Iron Ore Project in Guinea. Prior to taking up this role, Alan was President, International Operations for Rio Tinto's iron ore business, with global accountability for operations and projects outside of the Pilbara. From 2007 to 2011, Alan held the dual roles as Chief Financial Officer for the iron ore group, as well as Managing Director of Global Development. And before this, Alan was the Chief Financial Officer of Rio Tinto Energy America, and he has held a range of tax and finance roles in London, Perth, Brisbane, and here in Melbourne. So reflecting on that part of the introduction, Alan's been very busy with a lot of roles in Rio Tinto. Before he joined Rio Tinto, Alan worked at Coopers and Librand in Brisbane, which is now price of, part of PricewaterhouseCoopers, and he holds a Bachelor of Business Accountancy and a Bachelor of Laws from Queensland University of Technology and a Master of Laws from the University of Sydney. He is a member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants in Australia and until April 2012, he was a director of the Art Gallery of Western Australia. Members and guests, could you please welcome Alan Davies to the Melbourne Mining Club. Well, thank you very much for that um, quite comprehensive introduction. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here. And uh, thanks for inviting me to speak at what is this really prestigious uh, function. I'd just like to acknowledge uh, Sir Avi Pabo, who's the, the patron of the Melbourne Mining Club, which has really become an institution. And it's an honor for me to be here today. Just reflecting on the intro, introduction and some of the roles that uh, I've had the opportunity to do in Rio Tinto. Also, we have uh, two former CEOs of Rio Tinto, or predecessors, CRA, at our table. You know, Sir Rod Carnegie and Lee Clifford. And as a matter of fact, when I was uh, being persuaded to take one of those roles, I walked into Lee's office and he said, Alan, I've moved 18 times. <laughs> And, uh, of course, uh, really pleased that uh, I took Lee's advice and um, took a couple of roles outside my comfort zone. So today I'd like to talk about uh, innovating to shape our future. But firstly, let me start by paying my respects to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Wiradiri people of the Kulin Nation. It's great to be back here in Melbourne as well. I lived and worked here for a couple of years back in the late 90s. I then moved to the iron ore business following the acquisition of NOR. That was many moves, continents and businesses ago, as Patrick mentioned. Today I'd like to talk about the global trends that are determining the future context for our industry and how we, the industry, are best positioned to shape our own destiny. But first, Let's talk about the reality of right now. I'm sure you'll agree it's been quite an interesting time recently, a turbulent time for the markets, be they commodity markets, equity markets, bond markets, foreign exchange markets. Volatility is certainly starting to feel like the new norm. We've seen iron ore prices steadily decline, oil prices dramatically slump, copper and aluminium moving in all types of direction. Some of these movements and fluctuations come off the back of commentary from the latest OECD or World Bank outlook, or someone's positive or negative take on China's economic data. Here's a case in point. 
Just last month, China reported its GDP growth figure for 2014. The number was 7.4 per cent. This was seen by some as a disappointing result, the lowest level in 24 years. Terrible, in fact, a crisis in many people's eyes. Others saw it in a different light. In the past decade, China's economy has grown fivefold. It's now second in size only to the United States. This is a magnificent achievement. Tens of millions of people have been lifted out of poverty. So when you read a story next year about China's growth slumping to a 25-year low, keep in mind that its economy will be 25 times the size it was in 1990. I see this type of divergent reporting as part of the challenge of sifting through the modern news cycle and talk about commodity prices. So just what are we talking about? Is it simple short-term inventory and price changes? Or is it deeper fundamental trends? Or as the economist John Maynard Keynes might put it, the emotions, the animal spirits of market confidence. It'll probably be a combination of all of these factors. I'm sure everyone here will have their own view or their own take on what is happening in the markets. I'd rather not focus on prices today. That would be ill-advised for a number of reasons. Firstly, and most importantly, to do so would be to focus a conversation on the short term. So what I urge is that we don't get distracted by trying to call the end of the demand cycle. For we must keep our focus on the long term and the very real needs of our customers. Let me provide an example of what I mean. The year is 1966. In that year, Rio commenced operations in the Pilbara at Mount Tom Price with the help of its partners and customers. It was also the year that Toyota introduced the Corolla to the world. So now for almost 50 years, Toyota has been building upon customer loyalty to the point where the Corolla has been the world's top selling car. Toyota doesn't see the mid-sized car market as something to complicate. It sees its customers' needs and just gets on with meeting them. When you have clear competitive advantage, great relationships, great products, you don't just follow the market. You look to shape it with a clear eye to the future. The future looks pretty robust for our industry. We just need to make sure we build in agility and resilience into our businesses. The long-term fundamentals are pretty clear. The world will continue to demand the metals and minerals that make modern life work. By 2050, the world's population will increase by a third to almost 10 billion people. Across the globe, 70 million people each year are entering the middle class. Even if we restrict our view to China, around 170 million people will move to an urban environment in the next 10 years. But let's look more globally. India has grown at almost 8% a year over the past decade, and by 2030 will represent about 10% of global GDP. And what of Africa? Over the decade, the continent has enjoyed economic growth in excess of 5% a year. By 2050, its population will double to 2.4 billion people. Sub-Saharan Africa's population will increase by a billion people. The key point is that each country and each continent has its own time, its own growth evolution, and its own development trajectory. That variety is a blessing to the mining industry. It's also particularly a blessing to the diversified producers. Diversification is often talked about in terms of managing downside risk. 
The other way of looking at it is that diversification can position you for the upside of every aspect of economic development. Iron ore and metal metallurgical coal are the girders of infrastructure and industrialisation. Copper wires and economies electricity needs, while light metals such as aluminium provide transport solutions. Minerals like titanium and products like diamonds are geared to the wealth of developed economies and consumers. In my own business, the Diamonds and Minerals Product Group, the demand for each of our products is forecast to outpace global GDP growth for the rest of this decade. Sounds like a great sector to be in for me, and we should move forward with confidence. With all the recent focus on prices, I sometimes wonder if we've lost confidence and pride in what makes our industry vital. What makes our decisions and actions matter? Now anyone can take a price, but leaders reinvent the way business works. Steve Jobs said it best, innovation distinguishes between a leader and a follower. Innovation will distinguish leaders whether prices are up or whether prices are down. The public may not always see our industry as innovative, but as you well know, Australia has a rich history in mining innovation and we've always prided ourselves on being a clever country. So with that in mind, I'd like to highlight three areas where innovative approaches to thinking can and are transforming our industry. The first is extending and broadening our understanding of operational excellence. The second is how we harness technology. And the third is how we're uniquely positioned to deliver value for our communities. It will be those of us that have the execution capabilities in these areas that will capture the most value through the cycle. Now, I'm pretty sure not everything I'm going to say is new, but to quote Keynes again, the difficulty lies not so much in new ideas, but escaping the old ones. So let's, us, let's consider what escaping these old ideas may look like. I'll start with a question about how we run our businesses. What does it mean to achieve operational excellence? I don't think anyone's going to argue the basics. You have to run an operation that keeps your people safe, delivers a quality product at the lowest possible cost. A clear example is the Pilbara. The story's probably well known to many of you who visited the Pilbara. The integration of 15 mines, 1,700 kilometres of railway, 11 berths, four ports, and a marine fleet of up to 200 ships. Now when we do those things right, across mining, processing, and delivery, the conventional view is we've optimised an integrated business. A business moving from pit to plant to port. But that's only the middle of the value chain. What is often not reported is the sophistication of more than 100 customers and customer relationships and the various iron ore blends and products created to meet our customers' specific needs. So when we talk of operational excellence, we can, and we should, look also to the extreme ends of the value chain, excellence in customer relationships and exploration. I see these as integral to being more than price takers, to be shapers of our own futures. Let me first touch on exploration and then I'll return to customer excellence. Creating value starts with the grade and quality of resources. We're in an industry where our assets expire, but we know the world will continue to demand our products. In China, the amount of copper in the power grid will double by 2025. 
This translates to 2.8 million kilometres of cabling, requiring an extra 15 million tonnes of copper. This is just one example of how the world is going to have to find a lot more resources. A decade ago, as an industry, we were de discovering more than 15 new resources a year, and now the number is less than 15. We know the great deposits are getting deeper and harder to find. At Resolution in Arizona, one of our most promising copper prospects, we've just bottomed the deepest shaft in the United States at over two kilometres deep. As always, exploration will remain fundamental to finding new sources of tier one deposits. The real likelihood is that the emerging technologies now available to us as an industry will start to uncover a new generation of deposits and increase our hit rate. We've seen the old core sheds, filing cabinets, often full and overflowing with tenement maps and assay results. Computing power has allowed us to move from simple information storage to business intelligence to interpret gigabytes of data from geophysics to real-time assay, real assays. I've little doubt that the pioneering work by the various research centres will help us peel back the terrain and open new frontiers. It's not to say new drilling and real-time assaying will not transform minerals exploration in the same way that horizontal and lateral wells have transformed the, sh the shale and oil and gas industries. Similarly, next generation airborne geophysics and surveys could provide the next leap in 3D seismic data to target new discoveries. If we want to shape our destiny, our definition of excellence must include excellence in exploration. So let's go to the other end of the value chain, our customers. We're no different to any other industry in that our job's not done until our customers are satisfied. In order to do that, we just can't integrate from pit to port. We must optimise from market to mine. So cutting costs will only take us so far along the value chain. We also need to grow our revenues. By working alongside our customers, we can and we do create new markets. Markets for different blends, different versions of our products, new applications, and sometimes markets that didn't exist at all. We've been doing that in iron ore, borates, titanium, and diamonds for more than 50 years. We're even doing it in coal with the development of our Hunter blend. We can also shape our industries through research and development of new products and applications. Take borates as an example. They're found in everyday life, from detergents to the glass in your iPhone to fertilisers, which increase crop yields. We have a research centre in Suzhou in China, which allows us to work alongside our customers in one of our most prospective markets, developing step by step. And then, of course, let's not us forget how we rather famously shaped the future of the diamonds industry. How many of us had heard of pink, champagne, or cognac diamonds 20 years ago? Deep consumer and customer insights move businesses away from the purely transactional, that is totally short term. They move it to a resilient realm of genuine partnership with our customers where the customer and the producer work to mutual advantage. So let's move on to how we can harness the value of technology. Rio Tinto is quite proudly a first mover in technology and is delivering significant productivity enhancements. You may have seen videos of driverless haul trucks, which have, by the way, now travelled the equivalent of 100 times around the planet, or our autonomous drills and our operations centre that looks like the control room in NASA. And then there's our diamond diavik mine in Canada, 
located on an island in the remote subarctic lake. I have experienced the unique challenges of this property firsthand, such as temperatures around minus 45 degrees Celsius, underwater ore bodies, no infrastructure, no electrical grid, and an eight week, an eight week seasonal ice road that brings supplies. The design and construction of Diavik is an epic saga of technological success on a grand scale. But while we're garnering significant benefits from our technology investments, I think at an industry level, technology still can do much more for us. The next leap we're starting to see is how technology can speed up learning. Traditionally, if we wanted two operations on the other side of the planet to learn from each other, that was a very logistically messy proposition, flying all over the place with an uncertain outcome. But a lot of changes when you see those geographically distant operations as sources of data, big, real-time and proprietary data. For example, in Brisbane and in the clever country that invented froth flotation, we have what we call our Process Excellence Centre. In that centre, we bring together live data streams coming off the mill circuits and float tanks of the copper concentrators in Mongolia and Utah. We can see and compare everything that's driving performance, both up and down. We can have sites on the opposite sides of the earth learning from each other in real time. Let us go a step further. We know we can get productivity improvements from new technology. The tons of fuel and megawatts of electricity we're saving, the lubricants and the water we save. We can be equally excited about the safety and environmental benefits we're delivering with new technology. Technology is also changing the nature of work, moving people from the cab of a truck to the console of a centre. By changing the nature of work, we can also reach out to generations of talent. And if you don't think we need to appeal to the next generation in a new way, then you haven't been talking to the same young people I've been talking to. In fact, we have a big opportunity to access more talent, create far more impact by better reflecting the diversity and the skills in the environments in which we operate. I think that's true on an individual scale. I also think it holds true on a community scale, but I also think it holds at a national level. Our industry is in a unique position to unlock far broader value just from our operations. It was interesting to note just last week some new research from the International Council on Mining and Metals on the importance of mining, not just to Australia, but to all economies. It ranked 214 economies. Of the top 70 countries on the list, 63 happened to be in low-income countries. In low- and middle-income countries, mining can account for up to 90% of foreign investment and up to 60% of exports. In many cases, mining is the most important catalyst and channel for foreign investment. I'm fortunate enough to have spent a lot of my time in developing regions, in Africa and in India, for example. Rio Tinto operates in places that have an abundance of potential. As I travel around the world to our sites, I ask myself the same question. How can we do a better job of unlocking it? And one thing I'm certain of, and adversarial relationships don't work. Basic compliance just doesn't unleash potential. In Australia, we've learned so much from our relationships with traditional owners over the past 20 years. I, for one, think we're dramatically better for it. We've created immense value together. But I also think we're better off as a nation of people, as a community of humans, that who respect one another. I think that's the model. 
I saw firsthand when we opened the Argyll underground, underground mine, located on the traditional land of the Gija and the Mirawang people, as they performed an extraordinary month day for us to keep us safe. It was the culmination of an undertaking we made to Argyll that we would not proceed with the plans for the underground mine without the approval of the traditional owners. It was a wonderful day and a genuine coming together of two cultures. I'm not saying this is a new or breakthrough idea, but what I am saying is that as an industry, we should be looking at our capability to catalyse growth and create mutual prosperity as a core to the way we do business. So in summary, we are in control of our own destiny. By combining innovative thinking and deep execution capability to the way that we run our business, apply technology, unlock the potential of shared development, I believe we will create far more value and shape our future to a greater degree than we do today. As an industry, we've always been tied to humanity and prosperity, and that will remain the case. But our role, just to be increasingly efficient price takers, or is it to do more? We shouldn't be afraid of new technologies, ideas and approaches. As the American composer John Cage put it, I can't understand why people are afraid of new ideas. I'm frightened of the old ones. Thank you very much and I look forward to your questions. Okay. We've got time for some questions here. So you've got uh, Ian Howth on this side of the room with a microphone and uh, Richard Shoddy over this side of the room with a microphone. If you have some questions, could you please uh, raise your hand, stand, and of course, when you ask that question, uh, just identify yourself. So where are we starting? I see Ian, have you got? Richard, are you over here? Thank you, sir. Alan, uh, Simon Aitken from RSM Bird Cameron. So just speak up, sir. Alan Simon Aiken from RSM Bird Cameron. Um, Alan, thank you for your presentation and a lot of that focused on uh, technical improvements to uh, drive efficiencies for your business. Um, Australia is uh, shortly awaiting the white paper on tax reform from the federal government. Um, what tax reform improvements would Rio Tinto like to see being implemented? Uh, look, thank you very much. Uh, for your question. Um, in relation to taxes, I'd just like to make a comment firstly about the importance of transparency of tax. So five years ago, we published our Taxes Paid Report, which actually publishes uh, in all of the countries down to a local level that we pay. And I think that that's very good transparency for which any consideration of tax reform you know, can be assessed. So clearly, We'll participate in the tax reform uh, process um, and as you know, you heard Phil Edmonds, our managing director here in Australia, say that we do need fundamental uh, reconsideration of the tax base uh, here in Australia to make sure that it generates an environment uh, for investment and it generates an uh, environment uh, for security and predictability about uh, how businesses in particular are uh, taxed. So the details of what uh, uh, you know, we would you know, want in that reform, you know, I'm not going to go into today. That's part of the uh, process of uh, consultation, but we will be participating very fully uh, in that process. Ian, have you got anything on that, that wing? Ian, out there? Richard? Richard's got one over here. Oh, sorry, before you get there, Richard, uh, John Cathcart from Thorny Investments. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, just a topical question, given the volatility that you mentioned earlier in commodity prices, with um, you know, an uncertain view on copper, but you're very positive, and iron ore, where we've had record production, particularly coming out of Australia. Rio is uh, 
given your background heavily skewed to idle or revenue. And uh, Dean Popper, how do you see that mix going forward? So I think I heard your question on, um, it was a bit hard to hear up here. So is, did you yeah, mind just... Yeah, the question was, how, how does Rio see the mix of products given its heavy weighting to iron ore ah. going into the future? Yep. Well, thank you very much. So Rio's got a number of uh, uh, product groups that, uh, as I said in my presentation, you know, feature at different points of the economic cycle. So iron ore and metallurgical coal are really the foundations for infrastructure uh, and uh, development expenditure when countries are developing. So China's been developing since uh, the last couple of decades. We've invested in iron ore. We originally invested in iron ore because there was a front end of development in China back in 2000 with the takeover of North Limited. And then 2002 was our first expansion of Dampier, really on the back of seeing iron ore as part of the, the key material needed for the development of China. So as we move through the development cycle, there will be increasing demand for other products. So clearly, it's been quite a, a successful investment in iron ore, and we have made exceptional returns on all of those investments we've made and continuing to make in the iron ore business. We also have positions in copper, aluminium, you know, the titanium, industrial minerals that will go through a later cycle development, mid to late cycle, and we've got a good position in those. So every commodity has its day in terms of uh, its intensity of use within the development of a country. And we think we're exceptionally well positioned, and over time that will balance out because the demand for some of our other products will increase as that moves through the development cycle. And then it's not only China. So over time, and none of us know exactly when it's going to happen, but there will be continuing development you know, because of the demographics of the world with population, the middle class uh, expanding uh, right through Southeast Asia and India and eventually through Africa. So having a balanced portfolio of opportunities to supply the metals and minerals at all stages of economic growth, uh, we think we're very well placed. Okay. Over here, Richard Shotty has got a question. Uh, Mark Nabrita, I'm the CTO for CC Australia. We're a technology company working with you closely around your operations. My question was twofold. One, I'm interested in the weightings that you apply about innovation in terms of the horizons, like breakthrough technology that might be 10 years out versus incremental technology that's more near term, and also how you're building a culture of change in your organisation that's capable of accepting different working styles like the remote operation centres, etc., and the Gen Ys and the new breed of technologists coming through. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. So innovation and technology applies over, as you rightly point out, many time frames. We did originally start looking at autonomous haul trucks back in the Tarong coal mines uh, 20 years ago. And so we have helped the industry supplying the, the original equipment manufacturers to move through uh, their development of some of those uh, applications of technology. Uh, we also are looking at uh, breakthrough technologies, whether it be exploration, whether it be uh, copper liberation uh, and the like, that do require uh, a much longer time frame and a proof of concept as we move through. And as you would know, we have, uh, you know, working very closely with universities, working very closely with other research centres to allow that stimulation of uh, technology and innovation um, over many time frames. Now, you know, organisations you know, do need to focus what you're innovating or what you're investing in research and development into what is going to move the needle for the organisation. Uh, 
in addition to, as you rightly point out, you need a culture of innovation that really makes it part of every, every day, everyone's thinking of every day. So the culture point is an exceptionally uh, good point, and it starts with uh, having a foundation of values and integrity uh, through an organisation where people trust and respect one another and that they are able to uh, do their roles to the very best of their ability. That's twinned with you know, a very clear objective you know, set, uh, whether it be from executive or whether it be from that part of the business in an aligned way. And motivation and empowerment of your people according to you know, a clear objective and a clear sense of how do we do things around here. But without engagement, without empowerment, you'll never get a culture of innovation because everyone's asking, what do I do now? You know, what should I be doing? That's not the culture that we try to form in Rio Tinto. Very much uh, empowering right through the organisation where everyone knows that it's part of their role to incrementally improve you know, what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Breakthrough technologies, lots of ideas come from all of our people around the world you know, because they know, you know, they're the ones that know how to make their task better and they're the ones that know, you know what is wasting time and energy. As you know, we've got an innovation, technology and innovation group uh, led by Greg Lilliman, uh, which does look across all of our businesses in terms of what type of technologies you know, could we use to tackle you know, some particular problems that would, would really change the, really change the uh, platform of our costs or, or our efficiency you know, to take the organisation you know, to the next level. So it does require focus does require support from leadership you know, to fund programs occasionally, but it does require focus. And as you rightly point out, you know, a culture of embracing just doing things better. Okay, we've got the time for one more question. And Ian, we've got one down in the middle of the room here. Sir? Uh, thank you, Mr. Alex Hay, Bay Host. Just as someone who's been at Rio Tinto a number of years, I'd just be curious, two fronts. The changing MDs over your time with the Albanese Walt, how it affected both how you see the business and more broadly and also technology objectives as you've discussed. Sorry, uh, could you just repeat? How you seen the have you seen the change in the company with over the last three or four MDs in your time at Rio Tinto? Mm. Uh, thank you very much. I mean, clearly, um, I mean, leadership is an important determinant of the culture of an organisation. Very, very much a very important determinant. And, you know, we have seen uh, a different review of how the company needed to respond in terms of a very rapid growth uh, coming through China. But I would say that, you know, we've been, you know, fortunate to have exceptional uh, CEOs at Rio Tinto. I mean, we have Sam Walsh at the moment, who's very focused on innovation, very focused on performance, but very focused on a culture that, you know, we treat money like it was our own and, you know, delivering what our shareholders would expect. But every decision and every thought grounded in value. Now, that's been very consistent with you know, all of our CEOs, and we have Lee here, and I know that the culture Lee set was very grounded in value and very grounded as well in a culture of uh, sort of mutual respect and support, which has really been the indicia of uh, Rio Tinto uh, over many, many years. So the culture does get set by leadership. Um, the system symbols and behaviours with which we act in the organisation are very important uh, because what we want at the end of the day is everyone to go home safely, everyone to improve their own life and reach their potential and to, uh, and to really make you know, the world 
and their world a better place. Okay. Thanks, Alan. Uh, members and guests, I'd like to call to the microphone uh, the CEO of Swan Global, our uh, very important principal sponsor, Lorraine Meldrum, to propose a vote of thanks. Lorraine. Diamonds are forever. Yes, most ladies love diamonds, and men will happily pay thousands for them. So it really does seem fair to say today, diamonds are forever. Listening to Alan's comments, knowing what we do about his other responsibilities within Rio Tinto, iron ore and mineral sands in the African regions, as well as salt at Dampier in Western Australia, there are clearly far more to his realm than diamonds. One can see a lot of sparkle up ahead. Fortunately, unlike some other commodities, the diamond price is up and looking good for perhaps as far ahead as 10 years. There are some challenges for Alan, but the outlook is positive. Rio Tinto is Australia's dominant producer of diamonds and one of the world's top five producers, up in that group of five with De Beers. That group of five currently accounts for 70% of volume and 85% of revenues in the global diamond industry. Diversity and innovation are important to our industry. Not only important, but will transform it. Well, enough on diamonds and other commodities. It's time to thank Alan for his presentation today. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Alan Davies. <laughs>